I'm Deb Dierks. Nice to meet you. We're just going to let it, we'll give it the Zoom few minutes, our academic minutes um, to give people time to get on. The easiest way to see my slides, because I use a different program called, mm -hmm, it's kind of fun, um, is to make sure you have it on speaker view. All right. So we'll get going in a few minutes because we are just at that time. Um, and see how they go. Give people one more minute. Hope everyone's having a good evening. And only has one Zoom call tonight because I, um, a lot of you are used to probably having a couple going on at once. At least I've mastered the art of trying to pay attention to two, or at least looking like I'm attending more than one. Um, but all right, so let's get going 702 and I'd love to have some time for discussion at the end. Um, I'm Deb Dierks. I am Chair of Emergency Medicine at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Um, so, and I have been in academics my entire career. So right out of residency, got an academic job and have had a lot of fun through it and wouldn't change anything. But I'm gonna talk about a little bit on how to succeed and really focus on some of the myths and some of the things I think we've had to adjust through. I know I've, I've had to through my career and really talk about academics and balance and um, kind of kind of phrase of think tripod. And that'll be really more toward the end, but I'm gonna go over some other things that kind of work around balance. So first of all, my disclosure, I am not sure I'm an expert on this topic. Um, been in emergency medicine a long time, but I can't really say that I have this all right. I have it okay for me. So I'm gonna put that caveat out there and have some ways. So when I think about balance, there's really a simple definition and that's really having your weight spread equally so you don't fall. It's also the ability to move or remain in a position without losing control or it's defined as a state in which things occur in equal or proper amounts or have an equal or proper amount of importance. And I really wanna focus on this last one because when we think of balance, we kind of think about equal, you know, having things equal. Well, I like that last one because in terms equal and proper. And so when we think about that and we're gonna get it, dive in a little more deeper, but proper, who defines it and what is that to everyone? So to add some a little bit of humor on there, here is a cartoon. We are no longer using the term work-life balance because it implies that your life is important. Now we call it work-life integration. So it's easier to make you work when you would prefer being with loved ones. And I'd like to give a big thanks to those of you who never had a life. You're welcome. So one of the things I hate about that is I kind of like the idea of work-life integration. And in other words, how does it all fit together? But because it gets away from that word of balance. And I think when people hear the word balance, they really try to view two things equal measure, right? And kind of that picture of weights and they've got to add up. And so really that work-life integration in a way resonates to me a little bit, but I do see how it could be muddled in that if work-life integration, you never make time to separate them out, which I think is something that's really important as we go through our jobs because resilience in emergency medicine is important and being able to have some time that allow away from work is essential in my mind to actually being resilient. So when we think about emergency medicine, what do we balance? We do a lot of balancing our jobs, whether you think about it or not. We balance duty hours versus optimal training when we talk to residents, teaching versus patient care, expeditious versus safe care, academic time versus clinical time, medical useful documentation versus documenting for billing. We deal with that every time we work. 
And as an academic faculty, these are really important things that we struggle with. Now, the duty hours versus optimal training, we'll get to that. Other people can make those decisions, but teaching versus patient care, fast versus safe, useful documentation versus billing. Every time I work a clinical shift, I have to deal with those things. And that's really about balance. So even if you're not going to be a researcher or an administrator or do a ton of other stuff, you're balancing stuff in your career and while you're in the ED. And that balance, you have to kind of figure it out. So I'm going to go over three of those components, duty hours versus optimal training, teaching versus patient care, and academic time versus clinical care, and really how those impact you during your academic career and different ways and different processes and kind of the history that have gotten to us where we are right now in emergency medicine. I'm also going to go back to that last definition of balance and focus on proper because proper is really interesting and it really goes around who defines proper. So back to our cartoon state, you know, dog birds seminar on work-life balance. This is Alan. He didn't balance his work and personal lives. Alan did nothing but work, work, work. And now look at him. I'm the one who tried to balance everything. That's Alan. He's the blank, blank, blank CEO now. And many of us may feel that that's an issue, right? That those people who succeed in emergency medicine are those that actually work a ton, right? And you look at them and you say, do they ever go to sleep? Do they ever rest? Are they always doing something? And I think the answer is no. I think there is the ability to figure out how to do this in your own way, defining what proper is for you to still have the career that you aspire to have. So when we think about proper, we have to think about how it's defined. Is it our society? Is it Society of Academic Emergency Medicine or CORE telling us how, what that proper duty hours are? How do we decide that? We're doing a ton of work right now from the workload kind of things with ASA, getting everyone together to define what is proper? What is the proper amount of procedures we need to do to reach competency? And I gotta tell you, there's not much data behind any of this. It's all what people thought. Other things who define proper, is it our profession as a whole? Do we look for the mean or the median and say, look, that's the medium amount of, everyone put work these amount hours together. This is the median, that's what we should be doing. But can we also look at that proper at an individual level? And that is, what are your goals? What's important to you? When you leave this career, what do you want to say about yourself? And what do you want to look back on and be proud of? That also links to your values. So what are those values that you have that you really are going to work hard to aspire to reach? Those things change. They've changed through my career. I can tell you right now that when I went into academics, I wanted to be the triple threat. We're talking about that in a bit. I wanted to be absolutely stellar on my research. I wanted to be absolutely stellar at clinical care. And I wanted to be absolutely stellar at education, right? I wanted to be the great at everything. I got to tell you, when I had my first daughter, when I finished residency, I had my second one first in my faculty. When I first year of faculty, my values focused on, I want to be a great mom. And I want my kids to be happy, healthy, and successful. And that really was, drove a lot of my career. So the day my second daughter was born, I became a nocturnist. I have been a nocturnist ever since. So way too many years, and I'm not gonna tell you how many, but she is gonna graduate college soon. So I have been a nocturnist my entire career academically. And that was pluses and minuses. I may have been a better researcher had I not been a nocturnist and missed meetings and said, look, I'm gonna be home. But that proper amount of my schedule was defined by me and it was defined by my values and my overall goals in my life and my career. So there's four stages of adulthood and this is really important because this changes through your career. Let me get that on there. One is the rad adult. And this is when you finish residency, at least for me, when you come out, you're like, I can do whatever I want. I can succeed. I can be everything I want to be. 
Then you kind of go through the sad adult being, I wish I really could do what I wanted. I've got somebody else making the schedule for me. I've got kids at home. I've got life to deal with. Then you go to the mad adult, which is like, you know what? These youngins coming up, they can say and do everything they want to do. And they think they can get it. And then you get the dead adult, which is, this is not what I really wanted. So your career, you're going to go through some stages. And again, it's how you address these stages, how flexible you are through these stages and how you move through them that's really important. So back to balance, work-life balance. First of all, I hate this thing because it looks like balance is in the middle. Again, perfection, everything's gonna be smooth. I'm gonna work as much as I have my personal life. The reality is that lever it goes in between and it goes in between depending on what the, your needs are and what you're doing. And it goes in between based on what you want. And I think having a successful academic career makes you realize you're going to have to set where your tank is, how comfortable you are being on empty on sometimes and how comfortable you are going to be on full because we all have to make those choices throughout our lives. And these are important choices for you because you have to accept the consequences of them. And that is what I think is hard about academics is we have our own consequences to our actions. If I wanna be home more or work all nights, I know that I'm gonna miss administrative meetings during the days. So what I have to do is I have to work every weekend or I have to accept missing them. And maybe missing those meetings during my early career would have stopped opportunities uh, when I could, you know, that I would have benefited me, my research or benefited my ability to educate. And so they're all consequences for what we do. And that's okay. You just have to realize you're going to have, to, you'll have to accept them. So first of all, I love this 20 jobs for worth like balance. These are small print because you know what? Emergency medicine is not on there. When you look about work-life balance, what's on this? Being a lifeguard, right? A lot of us didn't want to be a lifeguard. And so inherently based on our job choice, we didn't choose a career known for its terrific work-life balance. We chose emergency medicine, right? A 24 seven, 365 day a year career. Not on this list for work-life balance. Matter of fact, probably never gonna be on any list for work-life balance because people are gonna perceive this isn't what they want. Majority of the people would say, nope, that doesn't really meet the definition for me. So as a specialty, we can't use anybody else's definition. We have to use our own. So going back to what we balance in emergency medicine, I'm really proud of our specialty because the first thing we balance is duty hours versus optimal training. And although I will fully agree that there is no great literature on most of the stuff we do in our training, I'm proud that we actually made a difference. So this is physicians, right? Not, not careers, but physicians. And when you look at it and look at the specialties and the top rated average specialties for work hours and schedule flexibility, physical medicine and rehab, derm, radiation oncology, orthopedic surgery, and emergency medicine. So residency work-life balance by specialty, we're in the top five. Kind of surprising but maybe it's just because we have the luxury during residency of shift work. And we have figured out how to do that in a manner that keeps people and has some time, and people have, our residents have some time to actually have some sort of life. But we have also been leaders in this field. So this is kind of duty hours in emergency medicine. It was put out in consensus of 2008. And we have always been ahead of the curve. In 1990, our RRCEM managed or mandated that people have one out of seven days off and that shifts are no longer than 12 hours. Kind of sounds silly, right? We all know. And since then, all of us have recognized that 12 hours aren't the optimal length. But in the 1990s, when people were working 24 hours a day as residents coming in the ED, this was a huge change. In 1995, our RRC said, no, nope, not even 12 hours. 60 hour clinical week while in the ED. So 12 hours with a norm. So we've gone from mandating one to seven days off to one, two out of seven days off because if you're working 12, 60 hours is five days. And then 2003, they even more and more granted. So look at, you know what? 
60 hour clinical work week, but lectures and didactics and other meetings can't exceed 72. So as a specialty, we've worked pretty hard to try to put some limits on work hours. So the Institute of Medicine kind of came out and some of the recommendations in there were a little bit thought to be a little far-fetched. For example, they recommended a five hour nap sleep period during a shift. They also recommended a cap in number of patients and no limit to the number of nights. Some of those were integrated into other specialties, but kind of emergency medicine, our, our kind of leading founder said, we're gonna push back. And what they said was, is that a greater concern is the already observed slower throughput time for admitted patients waiting for resident care, which will increase ED crowding and decrease patient safety in academic institutions. So they weren't just talking about us, but darn, in 2008, they predicted this. This is exactly what we've seen, right? So when we limited the number of patients to an inpatient service, med a resident medicine service, right? Made sure that they slept a certain amount of periods. Being on the ground floor in the ED, this is what we experience, right? Slower throughput, a lot more cap services, call somebody else. And actually what probably suffers and it's great for learning because people shouldn't work as many hours as they do, but we have seen a, an impact on our ED throughput because of some of these changes other specialties have implemented. So another Dogbert who's really great about saying balance, welcome to Dogbert School of Time Management. Today, you will learn that rudeness and good time management are the same thing. How good are you at saying no? So one of the things we have to think about when we kind of think of how we, how we are gonna manage a successful academic career is there are things you're gonna say no to and things you're gonna say yes to. And I would suggest go back to you what you, how you define proper based on your values, right? And your goals. I can't say I did this really well. I, I say yes to almost everything. Kali, I'm here on, on a Tuesday night. I think it's Tuesday, Tuesday night lecture to you all because I think it's good and it's fun and contributing to our specialty is something that I really enjoy. And so I say yes to things like that because I feel that giving back to my specialty is something that makes me, gives me some gratitude, right? And good purpose to who I kind of want to be and what my goals are in my career. And so saying no is something you're going to be asked to do. Again, it's all about your goals, your values, choosing based on that um, as you go through it. I will give you the caveat though, for a successful academic career, typically when someone asks you to do something and you say no, they don't ask again. So if you've got a mentor, a mentee, or a, 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 some opportunity that you think is great, but not ideal right now, just know that you're gonna have to really give a no, but kind of no, but I really want to do this in the future because people may not come around a second time to ask. All right, what else do we balance in EM? Teaching versus patient care. Now, I think this is really tough. And for me personally, this is really tough because I like to take care of patients and I really hate people waiting in the waiting room. If I had to pick one thing that drives me nuts, it's seeing a person out there waiting. And maybe it's because I had parents who were, my dad was sick and so he had to wait, but that is something that just really gets at my heartstrings and I feel so badly. And so I'm one of those attendings that kind of keeps going, right? And keeps going and figures out. So I've had to purposely figure out how to integrate teaching into my shifts. So resident management of emergency department patients is closer attending supervision needed. And this is in 1992. And this is when actually they said, actually, we should be teaching, right? Kind of mystical to believe that we didn't. But I guess back then they decided that all second year emergency medicine residents, regardless of complaints, there should be some supervision and education. Shocking, right? Something that is probably mainstay in most of our institutions in 1992 wasn't. They've also looked at what is that impact on service versus education. And we all talk about that a lot, right? Residents aren't there for service, they're to be educated. And how do you find the right balance? And this is going back to that 2009 kind of question work group. 
And what they looked at is citations regarding balance. And they said, look at faculty should capitalize on a teaching moment. You need to remind residents that talking to families, consultant, documentation, or educational activities. Okay, well, let's all say call bull. Not, no resident think that's an educational activity. They think it's an activity they do as patient care. But I don't think residents would label that as educational in all situations unless there's some education provided with it. Emphasize that scout work is on the job training. Again, no, no one's going to buy that. Teach best practices for EMR. I agree with that and shift service components to APPs. Well, in 2009, they clearly weren't in the same era as we are now, where APPs and that kind of impact on our kind of workforce has become a big issue. So some of these are good, some of them are just window dressing on how we really need to interact with residents and how we need to balance patient care versus teaching. So what I loved, about this is the impact on learners on emergency medicine attending physician productivity. One thing in academics you need to know is that according to this study, an attending with a resident saw more patients per hour than an attending alone. Even a medical student saw the same amount. So it is possible, a matter of fact, beneficial to patients to have that kind of team-based care. And Teaching with residents does help patient care, which is great for someone like me. And I find a lot of reassurance in this as, throughout my academic career that I know that by working with the residents and doing it in a manner as long as I teach, I'm actually helping the patients and we're seeing more than I could just on my own. They also looked at what about team-based physician staffing model academic emergency departments? And they said, look at if you have a staffing model of residents and attendings, both assigned to patients, compared to a resident attending team being assigned to patients, what was the impact? They looked at outcome of quality and amount of teaching. And they found that a team approach had increased perception of quality and amount of teaching. And the residents saw more patients in a team-based model, which is my guess what a lot of our trainees go through and a lot of the models we've set up. By realizing if you pair a resident with an attending, you're actually gonna get more teaching, and they're gonna do better quality of care and outcomes. So really, how do you balance this? How do you succeed and what are some pearls to it? One is don't assume anybody else has told the residents the information you think is important. Each one of us has a perspective and knowledge that is unique to our experiences. And sharing that, especially in a case space, is really important. You know, credit to Amama too, who kind of started the, the kind of new wave thing of writing lists and keep your list of what you discussed. That is a visual mechanism to remind yourself. So you end the shift saying, boy, I really did a good job teaching. And our residents, you really did try. For me, earlier in my career, I would take everyone out of the room and take a few minutes and sit down and go over a case. Right? That was time that I just focused on them. It's a little harder now, but still spending a few minutes looking at them, teaching them about something means a ton. And it impact, makes you feel like you've done a good job and the residents learn. From the resident perspective, ask questions. No one knows what you don't know but you. So get engaged faculty. Faculty want to help and want to teach. Give them the opportunity by saying, I need your help right now. Please let me know what you do. And then don't feel the pressure to see your next patient. That pressure should be felt by the faculty, right? And great faculty members do, and they wanna go help and see the patients and make sure everyone's taken care of. Academic time versus clinical time. Now, this is really important, but it's really different compared to what seat you're in. And so during my career, I started with a lot of clinical time. And over my career, my clinical time has dropped. And now I have more academic, kind of more administrative time, honestly, that I have to do, deal with. And that has been a flux and has changed throughout my career. Um, it's interesting what you value and what you find more fun. And I can tell you right now, I find working clinically a heck of a lot more fun than some of the meetings I have to attend. So when you're looking at academic EM, you have to have a couple of things in your mind. 
you will make more in the community when you graduate compared to an academic job, especially starting off. That may not stay for long, and that gap has been changing. So choosing a career of community versus academics should not be on money alone because the days of making bank in the community are kind of over, right? Especially this year, it's been tough. The longer you're in academics, the difference in dollars decreases. Academic hours are less taxing physically than clinical hours, not mentally, physically. And bottom line, there are nights, weekends, and holidays in community and academics. So choose your career based on your values and goals, right? That is the way to succeed. When you talk about clinical versus academic time from a department chair's perspective, there's a couple of things that just are true. The shifts have to be covered, right? They have to be. Somebody's got to cover them. I would love to tell all my faculty they don't have to work nights. I'd love to tell my faculty they don't have to work weekends. But we do. We went into that specialty because we knew it. I'd love to give everyone protected time to say, you've got all the time in the world. The reality is I can't. Dollars that support academic departments largely come from clinical care. So protected time is covered by clinical dollars. And so balancing who you can give protected time to and how you give it is really a lot shop dependent, but the realization it has to be that a lot of that protected time comes from clinical dollars. And so our clinical and pure clinical guys are the people who are the most valuable in our department right now, because we need them. We need them to get protected time to, to do research, to do more, to develop our education, to really participate. So there is a balance in the emergency medicine on how as a department level, you support everybody. But really when it comes down to, someone's got to work the shifts. And a lot of us have kind of transitioned into the era that when we started, where the old ate the young and the young came in and did all the work to this new kind of model where we want to make sure that those who are the most promising to have academic careers get that protected time. But that's tough when you're dealing with people who grow up in that model. So, all right, kind of down to the nuts and bolts. Traditional model of a balanced career, right, in academics was the triple threat, right? The three-leg stool. You have your academic career, you have research, clinical care, and education. You were supposed to be excellent in both. And when the people who my era came out saying, that is what we want. We want to be excellent in both. Where we are right now is something breaks. It is so difficult and almost impossible to succeed in research, clinical, and education. And so that really triple threat stool that we've all grown up with, at least I did, just crumbles and it falls especially when you look at an individual. So what's the solution, right? A lot of us went into that, that mindset and that wanting to be good at everything. Well, there's a couple of solutions. One is to look at things from a department model and which is as a group, can an academic career, can we made up with those who succeed at research and those who succeed in clinical care and those who succeed in, in education all together will make a terrifically successful academic department. That's one model that could work, but it doesn't really take into account you as an individual and what you want and how you, try, you know, how your career goes. The other way is to look at a quadruple threat, right? So on a four leg stool, any three legs can meet the contours of a vaguely even floor with a seat at a similar angle. angle. But movement of the mass in the seat will shift equilibrium to an alternative settling point. On a three-legged, there's no alternative. So maybe the option is add a fourth leg, right? So maybe the option is in your career, you say, look at research, clinical care, education, and entrepreneur, right? That's kind of the academic model in 2016. Everyone's going to go out to either start their freestanding EDs or urgent cares, right? And so those people who came in said, look, I'm going to do something. I'm going to add something else. I'm going to add, maybe I'm going to leave extra time to do a Botox clinic, whatever it was. And I've had 
faculty I work with and people I've trained do all those sorts of things, right? So they're going to say, look at, I'm going to make this kind of a four-legged stool. I'm going to add something else that's help balance it out. Or if you don't want, maybe the millennial model is research, clinical care, education, and family. All those pillars need to be equal, right? I can have a stool with all those three things, all those four things, pardon me, and that's going to make me happy. And I think that's a great model, right? Because I think that does allow and you know, values to come in, and right? And say, I'm going to put something in there that's a value to me also. But it's got some inherent flaws. And that is, it assumes that throughout your career, your research career is going to be the same. You're going to work the same clinical hours and your clinical expertise is going to be the same. Your ability to educate is going to be the same, right? It's got a stable platform, right? That everything's going to be equally important to you throughout your career. And I got to tell you, it probably is not, right? As you do more research, you're going to work less clinically. If you become a residency director, you're going to work less clinically and probably not do as much research. So that I don't think there's any way to have a career anymore where all these legs are equal. Something has to give. Our expertise is too great right now. The specialty and knowledge is too great. Our educators have education research, have masters in education. I can't, as a master's in epidemiology, do what they do. And so I'm not sure that we can all be equal and that we can succeed and have all those legs the same. We could also put really, add in some other things to those legs, right? What if it's family, clinical care, hospital, men in service? Same issue. Assuming everything's gonna be the same throughout your career will just lead to unhappiness because it can't be. I'd even say it's the ground even, and it's just really not. You're gonna have bumps in the roads in academics. You're gonna have years where your research is awesome. You think you're on top of it. And you have years when your grants fall through. You have years when you're the voted the best educator and you're like, I have got this. I am really great at this. And you have years when someone else wins it and you don't at all. And you get that evaluation that just eats at your heart because it says things like didn't pay attention or just makes a comment about you that eats you up. That's going to happen, right? It's just not a flat path for any of us. So there are good things with a triple threat concept. It values everything equally. And as a, a department and as a physician, our educators have been strong, have struggled through, you know, for the last 15 years to be valued just as expert, as much of experts as researchers. So I like that idea that everybody has their expertise and we need to value all three equally. And as a department, we have to. The four legs, kind of good, but it allows us a little bit to assume that we have to have at least three of the legs the same, right? Because we got a shift and that may not always happen. So I think the solution is thinking about your academic career as a tripod. When you can move these legs, even if it's just three, and I don't, and I have to be three because I don't think they make a four-legged tripod, at least one I couldn't see, couldn't find. You can move them up and down and it can allow you to transition through your career spending some more time or more expertise on others, and you still stay balanced, whatever your definition of balance is. So I think the triple threat should be gone. I think it's idealistic. And I think we should all value the triple pillars of research, clinical care, and education. But as an individual, we have to accept that there are gonna be times when we need to stretch the other legs or we're given the opportunity to stretch the other legs and we can lower some other things so we can succeed and still say, feel successful in our career. You know, when I went in again, you know, I went in as a researcher. I had times in my career where I thought that was exactly what I was gonna do and times when things didn't go that well. Um, but I was able to throughout my research career to do it. And then I became department chair. And my research time is down, right? So I've had to figure out how else to do something I have loved for the last 15, 20 years to do something different, right? And take value in something else. And that value can be in improving clinical care. And that value can be in making sure our residents at, you know, at UT Southwestern are given the best opportunity to be educated by amazing faculty that I have the privilege to hire. 
right? So I've been able to move that stool and still figure out what based on my goals and values makes me feel like I am still happy and resilient and enjoy a career that I love. So how do you do that? Be flexible in what you do and expect of yourself. The amount of time you can spend at work on certain things on research is not the same when you have two young kids as when you don't have two young kids. Develop a niche of interest, right? I can go back on my cardiovascular research anytime I want. And I can call those people who I've developed great friendships with to make me still feel happy because I have that such a, a niche. Don't focus on the job title, but on the job itself. Titles are cheap. Matter of fact, I can give out titles for anything I want. I can name anybody, you know, Grand Poobah of something if that makes them happy. But really what's important and what should matter to you is the job you're doing. And then continue to explore through your career. It's okay to move those legs up and down if you find something that you're more passionate about. You know, I, one of the people listening while Green was in private practice for a lot of times and has joined UT Southwestern and is a terrific educator. He changed, right? His career changed. He gave himself the luxury of doing that. And so really give yourself some flexibility and grace to explore things throughout your career. Give it a try. So balance is not better time management, but better boundary management. Balance means making choices and enjoying those choices. And I would also add accepting the consequences and give yourself some grace, right? We have the opportunity. You guys are gonna have a great career in emergency medicine. It's terrific to be in academics on, but it's all about managing your expectations at the time you're in and living in that moment. So life is like riding a bicycle to keep you balanced, you must keep moving. To me, that means don't look back, right? A change or a challenge is just that, it's gonna make you a better person, right? I think I've grown the most from my failures, right? They've made me not fear to try things to succeed. So accept things that don't go out, figure out what works and keep moving on. How do you do that? If I had to give you how, do you, how do you integrate all that when you're like first starting out? Think about mentors, sponsors, and coaches, right? And I think they're all three valuable. They all do different things. A mentor teaches you how to navigate, can be formal, informal, they're the expert. They've achieved knowledge and they work with you behind the scenes. To me, a mentor, if you like cooking, the mentor writes the recipes right? This is what you need to follow to succeed. A sponsor is a lot different. A sponsor focuses on establishing your reputation and visibility. They're there to support you. Usually they're more senior and influence. A sponsor is the person who opens the door and says, go, fly, right? Here it is. You do everything. You take your skills and go, and they believe in you to do that. A mentor would advise you to become a member of an editorial board of a major journal. Your sponsor would recommend you to the editor, right? Difference. And what is growing more and more in popularity is a coach. A coach is there to have you just figure out things yourself. So a coach will talk to you. And if going back to a cooking analogy, will give you the ingredients and line out a bunch of ingredients and say, make something right? Figure it out. What tastes good to you, right? They're there to provide you feedback, to listen and change your, help you develop your words into a plan to follow your gender. And I think coaches are invi invaluable when you're thinking about doing a career change, when you're thinking about how I need to alter things. If you're having some difficulties figuring out that you're not really happy with what you're doing, they're the right person to figure out how you can verbalize why. And I think they're all important in your career. So getting back to it, why I think life should be a tripod, balance should be defined by you. And I can't emphasize that enough. You're going to face challenges. We balance things in our entire life and our careers all the time. Don't take little things for, for granted and be flexible. Think of your career like a tripod, 
right? There are going to be ups and downs. You are going to have to go back to other things to make, to kind of fulfill your career. And that's okay. Use resources to help navigate, use your coaches, use your mentors, use your sponsors, and you will have a great career. And that is, I think, all I have. So let me just change this. There you go. And any questions? So Walt said, uh, when you mentor a young faculty to take a direction away from clinical resource toward administration, when would I? Uh, are the two ever compatible? Or do you have to choose one leg of the tripod over another? Um, I think you don't ever have to choose one leg over the other. I think you have to realize that in order to really be excellent and meet like your own definition of success, you may have to focus more on one at a time. So as in, I think, you know, to be a great researcher, it's going to take time away from that bedside and time away from being that person and developing those education skills or those soft skills to be a terrific bedside educator. And so I think it's really hard to do both. And I think researchers tend to like to talk about things a little different than pure educators do. And so I think you have to, you have to flex a little bit. And what, when would I mentor a young faculty to take a direction away from research or education toward administration? Um, I think that a lot of time people go into administration because they don't want to work clinically. And I think that is the absolute wrong reason to go into administration because I think administration um, requires someone who loves that clinical environment and wants to solve problems in that clinical. And so I think the young faculty that I would move toward that direction is someone who still looks at problems as a way to solve them and still has that kind of mindset of valuing that clinical. Um, and so I think it's really a special person that I would talk away from research or education to go into administration. And can you build an academic career from residency and how, I'm missing some words there, from DE residency and how? I think just from finishing residency, I, if that's the question, Sophie, do you have a, Advice? Hi. All right. So how I am a resident. Huh? I am me? a resident here in Tilly. So and my question is, can you build a, a academic career during the resident? Uh, right. I am a second year and I want to be academic, but I don't know how I can do it during the, the resident. So great question. And so can you build an academic career from residency? I don't think you can build a career. You can build a direction and figure out what you're interested in through your residency, right? So there are a lot of opportunities. I think this is great. One of them, figuring out what you're passionate about. Are you passionate about education, education research? Are you passionate about, about clinical research, right? Are you passionate about ultrasound? And once you find an area you're passionate about, try to get engaged with faculty who have those interests and to help get an academic job because they were tough right now. Um, try to do some work with those academic faculties to show that you have really kind of taken a deep dive into those topics. I think that's really important, right? So what I like to see when people come out of residency and really want academics, is I'd like to see something on their CV that shows it. Either lecturing to residents, you know, doing the ultrasound curriculum, teaching ultrasound to medical students, something that shows that they've kind of really invested in it um, and they've got some street cred to it. What we see a lot of uh, for residents who wanna go into academics is they finish a residency program and they apply for a job. And the first thing they say is, I wanna be a residency director. And you say, well, why, how? And they're like, I like teaching, right? But they don't have anything to show that. So I think early on in your residency, get engaged in things you're passionate about. So you actually have that ability to show your future employer that you invest in this early on. And, and your intern year, you shouldn't do anything. Your intern year, you need to survive. But I think your second year um, is when you need to start getting more engaged and starting building that CV or building those relationships with faculty who can help you along the way. 
Thanks. No problem. Any other questions? Typed in the name of the program I used. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Don't want to keep you all too long. Totally appreciated you being here and uh, appreciate your interest in SAM and the faculty development. This is a great career and please don't assume anything I said doesn't mean I am absolutely passionate and excited about what I've done. Um, I love what uh, academics, emergency medicine wouldn't do anything different. Um, kind of love it so much that my daughter who's in medical school is thinking about going into it. So must love it at work and at home. So I uh, appreciate all your guys' time. Thank you. <laughs>